All right. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you um, that are new to the show, new to our community, um, SML is the largest and the oldest undergraduate poker dream lab in the country. So to our intro to shark students that just arrived yesterday, you're at the lab. It's a long running lab with a long history. So welcome. Um, and the lab is jointly run by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University. Um, for our guests joining us remotely, so I'm talking to you all on the screen, um, you should know that on island we have three classes with us. We have our marine environmental science class. Where are you? Yeah, and then we have our second section of introduction to sharks, skates, and rays. And then our marine ecosystem research and management class. Come on, y'all. Um, so um, our seminar series is lovingly referred to as a rock talk. Someone was asking me why it's called a rock talk. Um, and that's in part because back in the early days of the lab seminar, the lectures were given out in the entire rocks. So that's why we call them rock talk still, although we've migrated to Hampton Commons. Sorry, it's so hot here. It'll probably be cooler out of rock tonight. Um, so these weekly seminars provide an opportunity for our entire island community to come together. You know, we get together at meal times and we get together at an event like this on every Tuesday evening. So it's great to see everybody here tonight. Um, so we are um, the format. The format for tonight's talk it'll be about forty-five minutes, and then there'll be a Q and A session at the end. It'll hopefully be filled with questions from everyone here in the room, but we will also be monitoring Q&A online for those of you that are joining us online. So please don't hesitate to chime in and ask questions via the chat. Um, so without any further ado, we are very pleased to welcome Anna Silverio um, for, uh, to join us tonight. She's a marine ecologist working on her master's thesis at the University of New Hampshire in Dr. Easton White's lab. Many of you that have been on island for a while may recall Easton taught a class out here at the very beginning of the summer. So we're very pleased to have Anna with us. Um, she graduated with her bachelor's degree in biology from UT Austin. Hook them horns. Yeah. Um, I do, I do, where she, where she worked on age and growth studies of, of the red drum fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and for her master's work, she's working uh, in Easton's lab, continuing work in the Gulf of Mexico in collaboration with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, um, looking at uh, long-term independent and dependent fisheries catch data and trying to couple those with a variety of different extreme climate events. Um, some folks might remember the very cold event a couple of years ago in February that challenged the Texas power system. That's one of the sort of extreme events that, that Anna will hopefully talk to us a little bit about tonight. Um, I also have it on very good information that Anna is a very accomplished futbolista. She played D1 soccer at UT Austin. So, and is a, and is a big Arsenal fan. So I've got a little bit of intel on Anna. So sorry, Tottenham Spur folks, if you're in the crowd, Arsenal's going to win. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I was just going to small correction. I actually played in Arkansas, but I'm going to get to that. No, you're good. <laughs> but uh, I'm excited to come here and talk with y'all today. My talk is going to be focused in two parts. So I'm going to be talking a bit about my career path, um, just because I think it's really important for me to pay it forward for all y'all. So you can see kind of what I went through and what I did to get to where I am. And hopefully I can pass down some advice and knowledge and give you some places where you can just start poking around for opportunities. And then I'll be starting that research talk. Um, let me get rid of that real quick. Stay muted. Here we go. Um, talking about my research that uh, we kind of prepped there for a little bit. So to start us off with my career path, I'm going to start here at the beginning. So this is little me over in Christy, Corpus Christi Bay, um, but I actually grew up in and around Austin. Um, so about three to four hours away from the coast, so not necessarily always by the beach, but uh, my family did have a really important connection to the coast. So my uh, parents immigrated from Tamaulipas, Mexico, so that state right below Texas. Um, specifically in and around the really important port city of San Pedro. And from there, growing up, 
Uh, my Mexican American identity was very important to me in my household. Um, growing up with my parents and my family, they passed down a lot of knowledge about our cultures and our traditions um, that really kind of shaped my interests early on about what I wanted to do with my life. We talked a lot about coastal communities and fishing, and outdoor recreation, um, as many of uh, you all can relate to. Um, seafood can be a very important thing in a culture from everybody here from New England. Um, so it was the same down in Mexico. Um, and so I was, I was really early on primed on those intersections between fisheries and communities and how we could connect together, both in environment and in, in um, those social aspects of our work. Um, I was never too far away from my dad whenever he'd be fishing, um, when he'd be filleting his catch. I was terrible at fishing, um, pretty ironic for a fishery scientist, but uh, I was never too far away from him whenever he'd be filleting his catch of the day. And that's when um, I really started getting absolutely fascinated at these intersections of fisheries and ecology and human society. Though at the time, I obviously didn't know what that was or what that word could encompass or that I could even study it. I had a very limited um, access to that kind of representation in my life. Um, as a first gen student, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, so for a long time, I just didn't really know that was a career for me. I just knew that I really, really liked the beach and aquariums and the environment, and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, as we kind of primed in my introduction, another big like Latina and Latino value that I had growing up is I played a lot of soccer. Um, so my original plan was to get an athletic scholarship and then think about the science later. Um, I started playing really early on at five because of my dad, it was very important to him. Um, and that was something we shared together as well. Um, and was able to work my way up to a D1 scholarship, which I did over at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff for two years of my life. Um, in that summer between, I was actually able to go play semi-pro in Philly. Um, and that's when I really started to realize that my summer really needed to, I needed to pick something. It was either gonna be playing and get training and get scouted or start looking at those internships and research opportunities. Because up until then I had no exposure to research and so how was I going to do assume that I wanted to do marine science in grad school if I didn't even know if I liked research to begin with. So um, I hope that there's a Ted Lasso fan somewhere out there. Football was life, but sometimes football is just football and that's when I realized that you know soccer is a thing I really love and I still do I still really love it, but I needed to start focusing in um, marine science which is where I eventually wanted to end up and so I transferred to a marine science program after my sophomore year of college to UT Austin. Uh, so I transferred there and I started thinking about these big broad questions. You know, do I like research? What part of marine biology do I want to be doing? Like that's a huge question that I think I'm still kind of figuring out. Um, how could I ever decide? Um, so I started the, with the ground running. You know, I, well, me and my friends in undergrad, you should just call it fish school, but I met a really great community my first semester at the Marine Science Club there and those organizations on campus that make those kind of community relationships more organic. Um, uh, we would take out yearly trips every semester to our Marine Science Institute. As you all know, Austin is not near the coast, which is where our most of our classes were. But in our Marine Science program, we are able to go down to the Marine Science Institute on the coast, take some classes, and do some research. And so um, here are some of our field trips that we took. Um, after my first semester, my mentor gave me advice. He was like, hey, we should start thinking about what you want to do in that summer, that internship you, you ideally want. And so he introduced me to REUs, which are Research Experiences for Undergraduates, which is funded by NSF. It's a really great program. Um, I did mine with Grice Marine Lab at the College of Charleston in the summer of 2019. Um, it, I did 10 weeks, and all of these are paid internships. So I was paid um, to do research for the first time um, with a really great lab here. I focused, oh, it was my first introduction to kind of fisheries work. Uh, again, I was with an amazing community of interns um, that I still keep in touch with today. Like, I think we just caught up like two weeks ago, actually. And uh, that was four years ago now. So it's just really awesome with people you meet along your way. And uh, my project was mostly based on biodiversity studies. So I looked at how two different patches of invasive seaweed are living in association with juvenile fish species in Charleston Harbor. So very tiny little baby fish. They grow up in estuaries 
And um, I really wanted to know if there was going to be a difference between a sparse patch and a dense patch. When we talk about invasive species, most of the time we start thinking negative associations. We think of the lionfish and the Burmese python in Florida, but not necessarily something that we were assuming in this case. We wanted to see if this uh, invasive species of algae was actually causing like a refuge effect, letting these little baby fish evade predation. Um, so we hypothesized that there was going to be higher biodiversity counts in the dense patches. Um, so this is a picture of me doing some field work. It was the first time I was doing field work. And boy, did I hit the ground running. And if you've ever been to Charleston, there's a lot of bluff mud, which is uh, something equivalent to like quicksand. Um, so I really were just like getting down and dirty with um, that mud that summer. And I honestly fell in love with it. Um, I spent, after I would do my bag stains and collect my samples, I would spend time in the lab um, going through, we would euthanize the fish, of course, uh, thank you for their contribution to science, and um, identify them down to species and sort them, and then that's how I would do my metrics and calculations after the fact. Um, I was able to experience my first oil presentation in front of everyone, which I do not remember because I definitely blacked out the whole time. <laughs> but it was a great experience being able to tell everybody in the area that everything I was doing that summer. And so I took that stride into my senior year where I did a semester by the sea program at my university. So during my program, I'm able to join this um, cohort of uh, other marine science majors who need, we need to take six credits at the institution. We can either do that through labs or through this program, which is what we did. Um, you had to take your classes by the ocean as well as, you know, do an independent research project. So I hit them up that summer, um, cold emailed a professor and was like, hey, I did fishery-like things in my internship. I really want to do something with your lab, which was a fisheries ecology lab at the time, Dr. Brad Ayersman, who is no longer at the institute, but he's a really good guy. Um, so with him, I worked at the Red Drum um, Fishery, where we use otoliths to conduct a growth and age study. So otoliths, for those who don't know, it's pictured there, but they're like tiny little ear bones for fish. Um, they can tell us a lot about where they've been and how old they are. You can actually cut into them, like a cross-section like I'm doing there by a, with a saw. Um, and that cross-section under a microscope can count those little annuli or those rings, like three rings, and you can tell how old the fish is. So in this case, it looks like that fish is about three years old. And so I can take that data and put it to a growth model and be able to evaluate the health of that fishery, which was really cool. And I was able to do this semester with a really great group of friends that I had met that first semester too, some that are very dear and near to my heart. Uh, we're also out doing really amazing things now. Um, and we also, where we did this sampling was at a fillet station where people fillet their catches. We went out there every Monday and Friday morning, literally taking fish out of dumpsters. Since most people don't keep um, the heads, they're just sitting there and that's where we want the otoliths from. We'd go in and collect that. But most of the time, sometimes, I mean, we would see what a fish had for dinner the night prior before it was caught. So this was a, a grouper that was caught and we check inside to come I in mean, like sex and eight, uh, sex and maturity and that stuff. And when we peeled that baby open, we found a, a snapper in there, which was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and this is where I really started, um, again, connecting back to those roots that I had um, with coastal communities. I talked a lot with recreational fishermen and anglers um, and other fishers at those fillet stations when they'd be in there at the same time, filling their catches or walking by, they'd peek in, you're like, hey, what's up? What's, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, because sifting through dumpsters is probably not a normal thing. Um, and we, we get to talking and we were like, oh, we're doing this for some research and um, evaluating the population there. And we're like, oh, that's really cool. You know, it matters to them that the population is healthy because they want to be fishing those fish. Um, they also would offer up like, hey, I have some, you know, red drum and at home in a cooler, I'm not using the heads, you want them. Um, so it was a really awesome thing to build those relationships with those folks. And I really enjoyed that part of that research. As you can see, I did this in 2020. And I bet we can all guess what happened. So I started on January. We were doing awesome sampling. And we left the beach uh, and things got shut down over spring break. And I had to finish out that semester in my kitchen over in Austin in my living room over Zoom. So this was me at my final oral presentation at the end of that experience. 
giving my talk over Zoom. Um, I had to end up simulating the rest of my data. I only had like 15 data points. Um, this was also my first experience in R and uh, bless my advisor and the two grad students that helped me on, Phil and Derek, they were like, I don't really have time to really explain R to you. Here's the code, run it, I hope it works. And I was like, okay. <laughs> We would sit down and talk about what those little individual metrics would mean so that I could explain it to everybody, but I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so I left that um, feeling a little like I didn't really scratch that itch I had, um, but I knew that I found a really new defined goal, which is working in fisheries. So with that, I, you know, I graduated that summer um, in 2020 from UT. I started, you know, really defining those research themes that I had around biodiversity, ecology, fisheries, and stock assessments and growth models, since I didn't really get to fully really experience that with my project. I graduated in my living room, like most 2020 graduates did. Um, my parents did the best they could to make it very special, and it, it still was. Um, and I took a gap year, started looking for seasonal positions, research tech positions, and animal husbandry. And the reason I took a gap year was I had to really squish in a lot of my classes in two years since that's really all I could afford. Um, I couldn't afford taking an extra year. So I was like, I need to hit the ground running. And I was burnt out. I realized at the end of my undergraduate that all I've ever been was a student. Yeah, I played soccer here and there, but all I ever been was a student. I didn't know who I was outside of those walls in a study room or in a study schedule. And I really needed to figure out who I was outside of that path and knowing what I like and what structure works best for me in my work environment. My end goal was to you know, have a career. I didn't know how to be an adult. And so I took a gap year um, and I was able to find a position after a lot of applications, like it's like 50. <laughs> I got an opportunity with the Everhart Lab at my alma mater, which was really awesome. I got to have the whole like student ID to like faculty staff ID moment, which was really cool. Um, here, this lab focused on human genetics and used zebrafish as an organism model. You know, some labs use rats and mice. This lab used zebrafish. So nothing to do with what I wanted to do. I don't do genetics, less alone with humans. But they needed somebody to take care of their thousands of tanks of fish, which is something that, like, I definitely needed experience in. So I was hired as a, ma as a fishery technician. I helped maintain their tanks, their tank systems, feeding them, um, passing IACUC inspections. And so those who haven't worked with IACUC, it's basically the governing body of working with animals with invertebrates, making sure you're being ethical and, you know, um, making sure you're meeting regulations on euthanization and where they're kept and all that kind of fun stuff. So I helped them, you know, make sure to pass those inspections at every given point. I also helped out with their staining and PCR and just like little side things that I could do to help people along in their projects, which was really awesome. My molecular skills weren't the best. Um, and I was very terrified of a lab bench. Um, and this experience made me much more comfortable holding a pipette in my hand and using my microscope uh, like almost every day. It also gave me strict nine to five hours, <laughs> which was a big change to what I was doing as a student. Um, I didn't work weekends except for the ones that it was my turn to take care of the fish that weekend since you know they eat every day. Um, and it really made it to where I could grow as an adult um, while still I, having skills that advance, that I knew were gonna advance my career, in this case, animal husbandry. But again, this is during the pandemic and I still, as you can see throughout my life, I always need community around me and folks that I can relate to, especially as imposter syndrome really gets to you in these spaces. Um, and so I, I struggled finding that and I found it online actually with Miss Field School and Latino Conservation League. Uh, so during this time, you know, I really, I connected with these org smiths, the minorities and shark scientists, for those who don't know. Um, they're a really great organization that helps people um, in um, historically excluded groups. It was founded by four amazing Black um, shark scientists to find opportunities and get mentorship and, just, you know, kind of taking back those barriers that exist for so long in these spaces. Um, and with them, I actually was in connection with field school and who are an amazing group out in Miami, Florida, their main goal is basically take people out on week long shark tagging trips and field excursions for like boat skills and 
snorkeling and again like shark tagging in a safe and inclusive environment so I was able to apply for a scholarship with them and was awarded and got to spend a week out with them in 2021 where again I met a really great awesome group of people I met uh people like Dr. Catherine McDonald and Dr. Julia Wester who uh helped you know a lot when I came to them and I was like I need advice for graduate school and I think I want to do that and I think I want to look at this and interdisciplinary programs and I don't really know if I want to I don't know where to start looking. Um, and so they helped, you know, guide me there for a little bit that week. I also got to do really awesome things. Like I tagged this beautiful bull shark on my first day, which was a really great experience that I will never forget. Um, and a, that week alone really helped redefine my research interests into fisheries, recreational fisheries and shark fisheries, into scenario interests in coastal communities and led to also meeting my advisor. Uh, so Julia, uh, Julia, Julia was a student of Dr. Catherine McDonald. Um, and when I was talking to Catherine a lot that week, she was like, you know, you really remind me of somebody I know, you know, you really remind me of Julia. And she just started a master's with Dr. Easton White over at UNH. And I was like, oh, how fun. Yeah, like I would love, you know, talk to her and you know, like pick her brain apart about that kind of stuff. And so I followed the lab on Twitter, for those who don't know, you know, Twitter's a really good space on the science side to find opportunities. And I found a lot of them actually. Um, and Easton and then his lab um, Twitter account, they post grad uh, positions uh, pretty often. So I followed him just to keep in touch to see like when they're gonna be posted again. I knew I wasn't ready for something that fall, um, but I wanted to see when funding would be available. Um, after I followed him, he actually emailed me. It was like, I have like my research interests in my bio. They're like, it sounds like, you know, you're a really good fit for the lab. We should have a Zoom um, talk to chat about it. So we had a Zoom that like June, and then we applied for a pot of funding with NSF to kind of get me funded um, since I got interrupted during COVID to get some more things under my belt before I really started graduate school. And so we were able to get that pot of money and that led me to, you know, moving up to New Hampshire from Texas. Uh, he pictured me and my family on that one of those days. Uh, so I moved in the winter of 2021. So I really was just like complete change. My first winter was a bit of an experience coming from Texas. Um, and here's when my research interests really started to like narrow down um, coastal fisheries and their management, who has access to these resources and how does that change over time depending on major disturbances. So that's where I am now. Uh, I started my master's last fall in 2022. I really wanted to, you know, strengthen my quantitative skills, which is what um, uh, attracted me to this lab. Working with larger data sets, learning about population dynamics, all three things that I didn't get full experience with working in the red drum fishery because of COVID. And I really, really admired the lab culture that Easton has built um, at UNH. And that was a big pro for me with why I said yes. Um, here with him, I narrowed down my research interests again into extreme events in Texas fisheries and wreck fisheries because I knew of the connection I had with Texas Parks and Wildlife and looking at coastal resilience. There we talked about, um, I was like, I know that they have a fisheries independent data set from like 1984 to the present. It's a really rich data set. I bet we can answer some really cool questions. So that's what I'm doing. I was actually able to present my first semester at the Texas Bay and Estuaries meeting at my alma mater, which was a really cool full circle moment for me. Um, and that's where I currently do now. Most of my time is behind a computer screen on in R um, at my desk. So it's a really nice change of scenery being here at Coles. Um, and some of my future goals and where I wanna be going with this work is I now I have just like these broad interests in interdisciplinary approaches, shark fisheries and shore fisheries are still something I'm very interested in that now I can take my tools down to. Access to the outdoors is also a very uh, important uh, research topic for me. Uh, coastal resilience and coastal community engagement. And in summary, I basically want my work to contribute to the accessibility of scientific knowledge, meaning bridging that gap between those who get to decide what happens in the fishery and those who those decisions affect. And to the resilience of coastal communities in a changing world, which leads us pretty smoothly into the next portion of my talk, which is my research which is assessing the resilience and recovery of important recreational fish species in coastal Texas. Take a quick little break here with my water. Uh, so to start us off, I kind of wanted to talk about all the major, some of the major threats that coastal fisheries 
are susceptible to. One of them being overfishing, something that I'm sure we talk about a lot. Another being anthropogenic pollution. So we have oil spills and plastic pollution as some examples from human use and human consumption that can change those population trends over time, as well as extreme events. The, the main portion of this talk, uh, we have disturbances like hurricanes and even winter storms like we have in Texas that contribute to changes in their coastal uh, population trends as well as then brings into question the effectiveness of those management decisions that they're making. And so all in all to say that extreme events are episodic in nature. So they happen for a bit and then they just, and then they stop um, in comparison to like overfishing and pollution that are constantly, you know, usually always lulling over those uh, populations that extreme events can disrupt marine fisheries in various ways that may require specific management actions right then and there. And so research in the past has focused on uh, either one event at a time. So this is a cold snap in Florida on five estuaries or one species at a time. So this is uh, specifically the spotted sea trout and they were actually found to be reproducing in the middle of Hurricane Harvey, which was really cool. So my uh, advisor over at UT, um, his, his lab, specifically Dr. Biggs, um, they left out hydrophones out in the bays whenever Hurricane Harvey was about to hit. Uh, they just didn't have time to go collect them all. So they were just like, I hope they're okay. And so after the hurricane had passed, they went out to go collect those hydrophones, hoping to just like mitigate the damage. So when they went back in and were listening to those recordings, they found them spawning. They heard them spawning in the middle of that hurricane when they matched up those timestamps when the eye crossed over. Um, so that interesting paper is out there. I think there's a New York Times article on it too. So if you're interested in that too, it was really awesome. But it, it was one species, one type of event at a time. And it's starting to become a much more conversational topic in the marine world, just as climate change is becoming much more of an important factor on what is how often these extreme events are happening. And so climate change, like I just kind of mentioned, has the potential to increase these extreme events in frequency and severity. And that really brings into question, how is that going to be affecting those population trends over time as we move into a changing world? And then the effectiveness of those strategies we have in place for them at the moment. Can we be more preventative instead of reaction? So again, past studies have usually looked at a couple populations at a time and really only one event at a time. We haven't had really had an analysis that really looks at multiple events at affecting the same population over a big um, long-term study, which is something that I hope my study can mitigate as understanding these relationships are very crucial for the future safeguard of these population and resources. But when we talk about extremity, um, that can be very vague. What do we mean by extreme? Who gets to decide that? So when I'm talking about extremity, I like to define this from previous literature in that it means notable and rare unique parameters means those parameters interactions with the system and also the context of those parameters. So I talk about that freeze event that happened in Texas. Freeze events and blizzards and cold snaps are not a rare and not a unique thing to happen in the Arctic Circle. Those fish that live there are living within their thermal limits. But when those events, that same event, those same parameters are happening in the Gulf of Mexico, then those interactions with the system become unique, become rare, and that is what makes it extreme. And to understand the levels of vulnerability in coastal fisheries, we need to, I wanna be looking at resistance and resilience in those, in those populations. Resistance defined as the ability of fish abundances to remain unchanged during an, and after an event, and resilience as the ability of fish abundances to return to that before reference state after an event, so that recovery period. And so I know I'm talking a lot about Texas, but like why Texas if I'm in New Hampshire? Well, Texas is a very large coastline, it's extensive, it's very huge, it has 10 major bays, which makes it susceptible to different kinds of extreme events at once. It hits with hurricanes, we just received a freeze um, in 2021, and past freezes that happened in 86 and 89, and I think 74. Um, so not extreme, not unheard of, but a little rare, but it's, it's in the historical record. But this allows us to be able to look at different types of events um, and, and not just one um, since past studies have usually been limited by their data sets. 
The other component is that they're, they have a very valuable recreational fishery. There's this thing we call winter Texans as people who come down from Minnesota and Wisconsin in the Northeast because the weather is enjoyable in Texas in the winter to keep fishing year round. Um, I'll be focusing on four of the most important of the four important wreck species. So the red drum, the spotted sea trout, the black drum, and the southern flounder. Uh, that will hopefully give us an insight on how these populations are reacting to extreme events. So kind of to piece it all that together, I mentioned earlier that the changing world, um, changing that frequency and severity of extremeness, the level that requires that added understanding and how this is influencing coastal fish populations, um, and then therefore that effectiveness of management decisions that we're, we're making, especially under the context of these multiple types of events that these populations are realistically being affected by on the Texas coast. So I talk a lot about different types of events, but which ones am I specifically going to be focusing on? One of them will be Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey happened August 25th, 29 in 2017. It was a category four hurricane. Um, it was the first major hurricane since 1999, which just means uh, category three or better. And the very you know, interesting and important thing here is that Hurricane Harvey was actually found to uh, have warming ocean temperatures be the reason why it, it increased their precipitation by 15%. So the thing about Harvey and why it was so detrimental is that it dumped a lot of water over Houston and Galveston. And climate change being a direct cause for that warrants some questions around what is that doing with population trends as well? And then are the current management strategies we have right now efficient enough? Next, we have Winter Storm Uri, which I kind of briefly talked about. It happened February 14th to the 21st of so seven days. Um, the entire state was under a winter storm warning. So largest state in the continental US, that's pretty severe. Uh, so that means also that every uh, all, all along the coastline was under an extreme event, which lets it to where I can ask those questions, those spatial questions on like what happened along that gradient. Um, it was also a 3.2 million fish kill. So it, it did affect a lot of our wreck fishing. Um, it uh, caused some emergency regulation changes. So how is that tying into those, those population trends over time and then the management decisions that we're making? And then something a little unorthodox that I wanna try to integrate into my study, exactly the extremeness of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we know, the lockdown started in March 13th of 2020. Uh, the pandemic status is still ongoing by the two, although obviously that's changed domestically. Um, and it's actually been found that the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced changes in the seafood industry and the recreational fishing industry. We've had record numbers of, of fishing licenses given out since fishing was one of the safest things you could do as a family. A lot of families signed up to go fishing, something you can do by not being near other people. So I really want to know if I can quantify that change in fishing pressure and see if what that does or what that did with the relationship between um, those management um, strategies that we had at the time and the population trends of the time. And altogether, my study design will look like this using these parameters to measure each event. So each event's kind of summarized into those unique characteristics. So freeze events have changes in temperature and freezing precipitation. Hurricanes is just a lot of wind, a lot of rain. And a pandemic, um, we wanna be using these counts of statewide confirmed COVID cases over time. So I want to really want to know what is this looking like interacting like in different bays within a bay and between the different species um, and then with every event, is there any differences? Kind of summing up my research questions in do individual fish populations recover differently depending on the type of event? Are there bay specific differences depending on the type of extreme event? And within the same event in the bay, in the same bay, are the four species recovery rates different? So basically just event specific and base specific and species specific differences. It's a very broad hypothesis that I want to share um, just to kind of give context to what we know about these fish species already is during hurricanes, fish populations, we hypothesize will exhibit the most resilience and resistance during hurricane events compared to others. But I talked about that spotted sea trout spawning in the middle of it. <laughs> so uh, we, we expect to kind of see that in the data. During freeze winds, fish populations will exhibit the least amount of resilience and resistance during cold snaps, especially in the most southern bays, which is where it hit the hardest, since this is kind of a bit more rare than the hurricanes that do happen every year. Though we don't have a hurricane Harvey every year, I hope. 
Um, but that is kind of what we expect to see. And during the pandemic, that's something we're really just kind of like, we don't know what we're going to see, but we think that the imposed lockdown and other regulations imposed by the state was enough to cause a change in you know behavior and fishing pressure that changed that resistance in fish populations. Well, how exactly am I going about this? So I talked a little about independent data. And so that just means that people out at Texas Parks go out and adhere to scientific sampling protocol, which is awesome for me because they do all the sampling and then I just have the data afterwards. Um, so they sample out in all 10 major bays year round, well, depending on the gear um, type. So we have bag sames that sample year round. Those target juvenile fish and rudder bays. And that's really important to keep in mind because when I'm looking at my data, I need to keep in mind if I'm looking at an adult fish population or a juvenile fish, because depending on which, needs to know where am I looking in that time window. Juvenile fish may be the effect of that adult population going through something. So I need to look like two years prior, right? Uh, I also have the gill nets that don't sample year round, which, um, which is where other gear types can kind of mitigate that um, blank but they do target sub-adult and adult fish as well as bay trawls. They are year round and do sub-adult and juvenile fish. So I have access to these three gear types for that specific reason to mitigate those life history um, problems I would have with a time analysis, with time series analysis, because all these fish you know, spawn at different times, spawn in different bays. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, so data is collected by Texas Parks and Wildlife, but I start after that. I take that data in, I run it through data cleaning protocols, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that I get it ready to go through a statistical software or RStudio that's much easier to um, work with. And I start making my fish abundant estimates. So in fisheries, we can't go in and count every individual fish in a population, that would be impossible. So we do uh, something called catch per unit effort, which is a way we can measure that fish abundance, uh, which is simply just dividing the fish caught in that sample by the time spent fishing. From there, I have been doing some percent change. So how is that changing from time point from time point? What is that percentage? Is it a negative or positive percentage? And calculating resilience and resistance metrics. So taking those definitions and turning them into numbers. Um, so I can compare across the four species and integrate them into a model similar to Patrick et al. in 2022. They published a really cool paper out there it took up a lot of hurricanes in different environments. So it's a very much more generalized study than mine, but they set up a really cool modeling framework that I hope the two create. And then from there, I wanna start thinking about management and consulting with Texas Park and wildlife. I'm lucky that um, one of my committee members is from Texas Park. So we have an easy way to kind of discuss my results from there. And I also hope to integrate 22, 2022 data in there soon. So I talked about resistance and resilience, and that seems like a little bit hard to measure. You know, I, you seem very intrinsic in nature, but Patrick uh, did a really awesome thing, was able to quantify the effect size change per increase of a stressor metric. So stressor metric, I know I talked about, you know, those temperature, wind speeds, that kind of stuff, um, and be able to quantify the effect size of that fish abundance. And so, it's really just a fancy way that they have fancy equations that I'll be able to, to also use for my study and fit into a model to understand these relationships. And so for today, I do have some preliminary results to show from y'all for y'all. Um, this was super early on when I first was diving into this data set. Like I said, it was very large. So you really need to know where you can start. So you, I ran some time series monthly averages over time, to just kind of see where I can start, you know, uh, diving into more. And so just to quickly orient yourselves to what the figure will be telling you. So each uh, square is a different bay um, and over time. So it is a monthly average from 2015 all the way down to 2021. And that is just the trend of, for, for Red Drum and why being cash per unit effort. So just some quick key takeaways. So you can see in San Antonio Bay, you can see these seasonal trends that Red Drum is just you know rocking along. It has the same peaks and the same troughs yearly around the same time. Um, the red dotted line is Hurricane Harvey when it when it made landfall. So you can see it's just you know it's chugging along. It's living life like normal. Um, in Aransas Bay and Corpus Christi Bay, there seems to be um, sorry uh, some kind of dip 
right after that event. Uh, we can't really know what that if that's attributed to the event precisely, but it's something that you know, where we can dig a little deeper in. And then the lower Laguna Maja, you see that peak after that storm. Um, and so we're curious to see what is causing that specifically. And the spotted sea trout, so same exact kind of figure, just a different fish. Corpus Christi Bay and Galveston Bay, seasonal peaks were lower after the event. And then you can kind of see it recover um, the following year. So you see at the red dotted line, um, it go down that peak and then kind of reaches back up to where it was going, um, it was reaching towards before that event happened. Uh, and in San Antonio Bay, again, that steady seasonal trend with the hurricane event, it's just chugging along like nothing happened. Um, the Black Drum, the San Antonio Bay and Upper Laguna Madre, there's some oscillations in there. There isn't a lot of activity in those other bays. A cool thing about Black Drum is they pretty much only spawn well, not only spawn, but they majority spawn uh, in the upper Laguna Madre. So this is not surprising to see. Um, but there's an interesting peak in some of these graphs towards the end in multiple bays. And the weird thing is that it's also in 2021, which if you remember, that's during the freeze event. So here we're focusing on hurricanes, but that lets me know that maybe that's worth looking into. That's a little, little interesting. <laughs> so that uh, I've been excited to kind of dive into. Uh, with the black drum specifically. And then the Southern Flounder um, in the Matagorda Bay, there is some peaks again after the event year. And in Galveston Bay, uh, there seems to be kind of like a U-shaped trend where it seems to be pretty high before the event. There's a lull during the event in and around that time and reaching back up again. So um, if you recall, like I was saying, it is hard to make any kind of conclusions off of that because of the data I'm using. So I'm using bag saints for those. And so when I'm talking about juvenile fish, I need really to be considerate of where I'm choosing what time or window I'm looking at. If I am looking at when that event happened, but the normal intervariability trend where that decreases, we need to be careful to make that, not to make that site selection bias where I just attribute that a population decline. Um, when it's just a normal variation that usually happens in that day. So that requires a lot more, you know, brainstorming and with my collaborators and how we're going to mitigate those biases, uh, which leads me into my next step. So these brief analysis that I did super early on into my research opened up some interesting trends that I could dive more into. It's a really big data set. And I incorporating those necessary strategies to aid that site selection bias and working with long-term data this summer with my collaborators maybe introducing a lagging time series analysis to change that time window I'm looking at, incorporating that gillnet data because it has the adult population numbers in there and setting up an accurate baseline number appropriate for that fish species on what I'm calling the book for. And uh, calculating that effect size to model resilience and resistance to the storm parameters like I talked about earlier. So that is kind of what I'm in the middle of doing right now. Um, so uh, I will, be hoping to publish that at the end of my uh, master's thesis. So hopefully everyone can get the ending of this saga eventually. <laughs> and with that, I just wanted to acknowledge my committee members and collaborators, those at UNH and at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and of course my lab members. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your time. Uh, very quickly, I have two really important um, QR codes. One are my references, but this one in that corner our Korean community resources that I compiled, some I mentioned today, that are were really useful in my time as an undergraduate and even in my gap year. Um, it's not an extensive list. I kind of get a disclaimer in the document, but there, that's there for you. And as well as my methods of communication with me for any kind of collaboration or further thoughts. And then I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Anna, for all of our uh, our young students and aspiring scientists. That was a really wonderful talk. So um, Q&A time. Anyone have any questions here in the audience? With extreme events, do you look at also like, uh, are things like biotic factors like uh, algal blooms and nutrient runoff causing like mass uh, dead zones and stuff, does that also get wrapped up in extreme events or is that its own separate entity? And if it does uh, get, is something that you look at, how does that kind of biotic versus abiotic factor change the uh, interplay with the four species you're looking at? 
Yes, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, am I also looking at biotic factors like things that are influenced by other organisms? So like your example was uh, harmful algal blooms. Um, and the question for that part is, yeah, that is definitely considered an extreme event. Uh, we actually played around with the idea of integrating as that one of my types. Um, we were already biting more off than we can chew with my master's. I, if I was doing a PhD, that's probably something I could have done, but I only have a very short amount of time to like really dive with these questions and I already made it complex enough. Um, but that is what we considered an extreme event when we were pro kind of proposing this project. And just to kind of play around with your second question, the second question was, what do I think, if so, that does to my fish populations, um, knowing what I know about these fish. And um, one, harmful algal blooms are really, you know, really susceptible to climate change since warming ocean temperatures tend to really correlate with that. I don't know a whole lot with these fish species in particular. I know that red drum um, are really hardy fish. So they they do pretty well in anoxic environments. A lot of research has done actually at UT looking at that specifically. Um, so in moments where there's a, a less oxygen, um, red drum perform pretty well in the sense of like their survivability tends to be better than other fish species. But um, I would be curious to see if anyone else does that. That would be really interesting. Any other questions? Right. The catch rates or densities rhythmically changed. Why was that? Oh, uh, specifically the spotted sea trout and the red drum, which is kind of where I saw that mostly. Uh, those fish are like a timer. They are really good at, at going through their pulse recruitment at the same time of year every year. So with red drum specifically, they exhibit that in the months between August and November every year. And so uh, there's a paper from uh, Roker back in 1990 that did this um, analysis and it's been pretty true since then. Um, so they're just really good at timing those spawning rates, which is something I have to keep in mind whenever I'm doing analysis. Uh, I'm not completely sure. I, I think I just, uh, I, I don't know what influences that specifically seasonally, but I, I just know that they, you know, go out into more of the open water to kind of spawn and then they kind of just rush back in. I know that there's a lot of research into that right now though. Like I know um, actually one of my committee members, her partner just is studying that pulse recruitment kind of movement in Texas as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, why specifically did you choose like these four species of fish? Like I know you said the red drum was really hardy. Did you choose it because it was really hardy and maybe the black drum is like less hardy? I don't know. I know there's like way more than four species of fish in any one of these given bays. And I know you said recreational fish, but again, there's so many species like why these specifically? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the question was why I picked these four species specifically. And the answer is a little less glamorous. Um, so when I first reached out to Texas Parks um, to inquire this data, they were really like, well, what part do you want? It's really big. And I was like, okay, um, all of it. And they wouldn't take all of it as a proper answer. So they were like, well, we have this like summarized data set on four species, which are these, do you want that? And I was like, uh, I, I knew Red Drum pretty well for my undergraduate. I loved working with Red Drum. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> so it's a little less glamorous, but yeah, there's a lot of different species in the recreational fishery. Um, so working with the, these are the top four most important ones. And so meaning that they contribute mostly to the economic value. So that's another big reason why. Um, when you're thinking about like effective management strategies, is that something you're going to want to do more research for to see how they like some examples like impact it, or is that something you're just going to kind of analyze with the data you already kind of? Yeah. So the question was um, what I'm thinking about when I talk about, you know, influencing those strategies at the end of this. Um, I, I hope my research contributes to that. Um, initially, when I started this, I saw that as a really clear path to a job. I was like, Dacus, you just saw me do this really awesome thing. I could sit down with it more and think about those, writing up that plan for you. Um, at the moment, that kind of life decision has changed for me on whether or not I want to go back to Texas. 
but um, ideally I would still love to collaborate with them and continue on on that like management side when I'm done with the science part. Hello, I don't think I need this. Oh, okay, I do need this. I love a microphone, it's been a while. Um, so I was wondering, um, you have home base in Texas right now. I was wondering if you are ever interested in maybe working with Mexican fisheries, giving back to your community, uh, your heritage. And I ask because um, I'm Brazilian American and I'm battling with the question of whether or not I want to work in America with environmental conservation or Brazil. Um, so I was just wondering what your goals are in terms of that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a phenomenal question. So just to kind of summarize that, asking, um, so right now I'm working with Texas um, and with my Mexican American identity, but I consider working with, or would want to work back in Mexico with those fisheries. Um, and I, I, I would love to, honestly, I would love to go back and work with those people out in Mexico. Um, I've met a couple of really great Mexican scientists throughout my career that do really awesome work. And I do see, I am open to that collaboration. It isn't exactly I'm hiding over in the sense of like, I'm not only looking for jobs there, but if that opportunity and that connection would arise, I would really like to. Um, I guess the advice I could give you was um, just including that into your search. So I like, I'm a, I'm a very like the chips fall where they fall kind of person. And I don't know how, how you are, but it doesn't hurt to at least look what's out there and seeing um, if that fits with your life plan. But I, I found I found joy in that too, <laughs> to be able to go back there and kind of work with uh, that initial community that my parents are from. Hi, um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, why did you choose to do recreational fisheries over commercial fisheries? And what's the difference between those two on a management level? Um, I just slid down a little. Uh, over commercial fisheries and kind of what that the differences look like on a management side. So the rec side, I, cause I kind of like worked on the outside uh, of it with my red drum work. So like talking to those anglers and there's fishermen um, and other fishers at the same time. And I was really fascinated by um, how much conservation we can do with working with them. So there's a lot of great studies and initiatives out there where they do educational programs and outreach programs specifically tied to when you're getting a fishing license on the pamphlets, on the signage. And a lot of good conservation work actually gets done in those in those sectors because they're they're the ones using the resources. They really care about the resources and that, that they're in good health or else they can't go fish. And so that way we can actually work together to do a lot of good in concert in conservation specifically. So that really attracted me. And on the management side, um, I'd say that there are a couple main differences. So rec fishing, um, the regulations more look like how many fish can you catch at once specifically. Um, what you have to measure. So you have to make sure you're gathering the fish at the correct length um, that is allowed for that fish. Um, and on the commercial fishery side is a lot more like broad scale because you're involving a lot of moving parts. So different countries, different organizations, different communities, different fish species, that fish is being fished in that area. That food could be going to all over the world. And so that requires a lot more moving parts. And so those regulations can look a lot different for those reasons. Um, this kind of is like an addition to one of the other questions, but I was curious if you're still wanting to continue this like research with other species of fish and also maybe like trying to combine it with like your interest for sharks. But yeah. <laughs> that, that's a great question. So to repeat it, um, uh, do I want to continue this work with other fish species and maybe going into shark fishes as well? Uh, yes, I, I absolutely, I, I don't discriminate fish species. I love all fish species. I'm a big fish girl. Um, and so ideally I would love to work with, um, I would love to do this kind of work with on the more like biodiversity side, like looking at fish communities as a whole. Um, so not just like four specific ones, but like across that, that ecosystem specifically. And with shark fisheries as well. I'm completely fascinated by it. Um, just because I know in Texas specifically, there isn't a lot of monitoring right now on the shoreline. There's a lot in the piers and the docks and stuff. 
Um, but you know, a lot of fishing happens on the beach and I would really love to like dig your hands into that kind of world too. Number one, two, two more questions. Anyone? We'll guard again. Oh, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, hi, I was just wondering if like um, these four fish, for example, occur in a similar habitat, and if you're looking at the effects of these extreme on one specific habitat, or if you're looking at it on different, so like, for example, I don't know how it is in Texas, to be honest, but like if you have like seagrass meadows or something like that. So the question was, um, when looking at these four fish species, am I looking at um, how different the different environments they're using during these events? And yeah, I do take that into consideration. So uh, spotted sea trout and red drum, um, those juvenile fish tend to hang out by the seagrass in those meadows. And so um, knowing that fish, so Texas is a lot of barrier islands. And so that just means that like, there's like strips of land up along that coast that makes it to where that bay inside is pretty large and long. Um, and so I'm, I do have to take bay this, like characteristics into account when I'm looking at these different bays. So like the Laguna Madre, for example, it's so large, it's technically a lower and an upper part, but it's technically one bay um, and it's extensive. So that barrier island there prevents a lot of mixing between that water, between that estuary water and the open ocean. So it's susceptible to, um, hypersalinity events when it gets super saline or when it dumps a lot of fresh water, um, it's susceptible to that change much more than a different bay to the north of it because this, the bay looks different. So I, I, I do have to consider those specific attributes when I'm looking at this. So I guess my question is, with like the storms and these cold snaps and stuff like that, it seems like there seems to be kind of more of an increase in those more like uh, intensity wise. Do you think that you might see more of a correlation as the increase in intensity and occurrence with um, looking at the resilience that that might eventually, there might be more of a correlation in your data? So looking at those changes in severity and frequency over time, and if that correlates with those changes in my data, ideally that's what I expect to see. Um, ever since that freeze event in 2021, uh, we've actually been under, uh, another freeze, not another freeze event, but like a, a cold snap happened again, uh, the next winter. So that climate change is really like weakening that jet stream. And so in the winter, that cold Arctic air that is warmer for the Arctic, still very cold for Texas if that reaches down. So for moments in time in the winter, we're seeing those blast kind of reaching down. If y'all remember over uh, the holiday season last uh, year, there was a, there was that big storm that was like in Chicago and the Midwest. Um, and so that caused some freezing temperatures again in Texas that we had to close the fishery again. And so I'm very curious to see how that progresses over time. I wish I could time travel like 10 years from now to see what that ends up looking like, but yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for Thank you, spending the happy. evening with us tonight. <laughs> All right, gang. So that was that was the end of this evening's rock talk. For those of you that are with us online, um, please take a look at our website, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org, for additional information about rock talks that are coming up in the future. Uh, and so next week, we are going to be welcoming. Give me just one second. Let me find my notes. Uh, uh, John Mohan from the University of New England. Um, and so John and his lab, he runs the shark and fish ecology lab at the University of New England. So guess what? Oh, he's, oh, all right. So keeping it in house with the Texas Longhorns. Excellent. So next week we'll be learning a lot more about sharks. So please join us. All right. So please join us for next week's rock talk. And thank you all for joining us tonight.